You could save big when you bundle your home and auto with Progressive, but when we just come out and say it, it feels like it falls a bit flat. So instead, we're going to have someone else say it. Because for some reason, when a random person talks about how great something is in a commercial, it's more believable. I saved with a Progressive Home and Auto Bundle. And there you have it. I mean, I'm not sure why she's more believable than me, but either way, you get the point about the saving. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Discount not available in all states or situations. Target has laundry day covered because they offer a great selection of concentrated Tide Pods to help with all your laundry needs. Tide Pods clean, freshen, and help rejuvenate your clothes with odor fighters and stain removers. Did you know Tide Pods clean better than the leading liquid bargain detergent? Tide Pods are powerful enough to make your whites white and your brights bright, even in cold water. Just toss in one Tide Pod for small loads, two for medium, three for large. It's that easy. For great value and convenient pickup options, get Tide Pods today at Target. Welcome to the Boneyard with Steve Robertson. As always, I am your good friend and host, Steve Robertson, here on the Hump Day edition of The Yard. A little bit earlier today, trying to get it out early because there's a pretty major announcement that's coming uh, at 11. A matter of fact, as you guys hear this, the announcement should be out. I'm going to break that down for you uh, in our first big segment of the show. But I uh, hope you guys are enjoying the College World Series. I know many of you are just kind of, you know, waiting with bated breath in some respects to see Ole Miss lose. But the reality of it is Ole Miss playing well. They are. They're in the driver's seat in their side of the bracket. They'll take on Arkansas. Uh, in, in a elimination game for the Razorbacks this evening. We'll uh, talk about the College World Series a little bit later in the show. We're going to look at some recruiting stuff, too. Uh, of course, Mississippi State still mining the NCAA transfer portal. We expect a lot more names to go into the portal within the next week or so. July 1st is the deadline, the transfer portal entrant deadline for anybody in spring sports to be eligible to play next season. So there will be a run here late as some guys have kind of uh, maybe went to some pre-draft workouts, have a better idea of where they stand. And as you guys know, too, there's no declaration for the draft in college baseball. It's not like football or, or, or uh, basketball. You, know, you, you don't even have to declare or you can be drafted and you decide if you want to sign. That's just kind of how life works. But uh, there will be a lot of movement – here in the next week to 10 days with the portal. As teams are eliminated from Omaha, there will be some guys go in. You know, we went through that last year. We're getting ready to play Vanderbilt for a NAFL championship, and we had a half dozen guys go in a portal or so. And it wasn't because they were unhappy or, they, they were, you know, they were trying to be a distraction to the team. It's just that's when the deadline was. And so now they've got that corrected this year because we're playing the college world series in less days. There's less rest, which is going to make uh, this weekend's college world series final series rather interesting, especially as some teams out there have to throw their aces tomorrow. Think about that for a second. You may have some guys throwing on short rest that throw tomorrow, which could essentially eliminate them from any meaningful innings in the College World Series final. But you know as well as I do, it's, a, it's an all-hands-on-deck type thing. But to expect a guy to throw you know, three meaningful games in nine, ten days, that's, that's asking an awful lot. But uh, the reality of it is the College World Series will be over before the deadline to end of the portal is here. So we'll get all the games played, and then there will be a run – and I mean there will be a rash of players going to the portal. And not just guys, of course, that are in the College World Series. There will be some other guys, too, that um, have just kind of prolonged the decision-making process for some time. So they'll go in. So Mississippi State, not in any real big hurry. There's some guys out there we've heard that are kind of leaning State's way. I don't think State's pushed just yet. But the reality of it is, is there's going to be a lot of guys that uh, Mississippi State has signed – or has picked up commitments from that'll be on campus for the second session of summer school. So they'll be here to kind of go through workouts and uh, go through, you know, the team activities that are basically kind of facilitated by the players themselves in advance of fall baseball. So, and I know Chris is a guy too that likes to get fall baseball done to give the guys some time off. So new names heading to campus soon. And then it will be some guys too, some high school guys that'll enroll for the second session of summer school that still may be drafted. I don't think Jet Williams is going to be one of them. I think most people expect Jet to go in the first round. There was a lot of discussion, you know, here maybe three or four months ago that, you know, Jet may be a guy that goes to school, but I think now the consensus is that he is a first rounder and that we're not going to see him. 
Uh, so best of luck to him. I don't think anybody's holding out any hope of him coming to college. But, um, you know, again, the reality of it is, is you got to go out and chase those guys. You know, so there's some people, oh, we lose all these guys for the draft. Well, if you go out and you oversign, and we traditionally do in baseball, you go out there, maybe you sign five or six guys that are draft risk, and you get two or three of those guys to come to school, you've won. You're never going to get them all. And you won't get them all this year either. Still some guys out there were kind of monitoring their situation after they went to the MLB Combine. So could be some guys move up, could be some guys move down. And so there's a lot to consider, too. There are a lot of people that are kind of new fans to college baseball recruiting. And, of course, the portal really really is becoming more of an issue this year. And I think because of the success of teams like Texas A&M, you begin to kind of characterize this and say, hey, you know what, hey, that might be the path, you know, for teams like Mississippi State that, you know, maybe the years of developmental players are over. You know, Mississippi State's always recruited at a high level. Chris Lamonis has got the number eight recruiting class in the country uh, signed for this recruiting cycle. But when you look at some of the guys that have gone in the portal, there may be guys in years past that uh, maybe have taken two or three years to develop. I just think that the pressure to win is so high today, you just can't afford to be patient with those guys. So you go out and grab some money from the portal. I think that's going to be the case uh, really around all sports. And one of the things that we hear on the football side from talking to high school coaches is, you know, the days of, you know, the developmental high school guy signing with an SEC school, pretty slim. Now, we're going to do some at Mississippi State. We're having a discussion over on the jeanspage.com message boards right now. Uh, Trevion Williams announced that he was going into the portal. And some people were like, well, hey, this, well, what's going on here? Well, you know, Trevion didn't go through spring. You know, Trevion hadn't been in college at Mississippi State. Trevion essentially gave up football. And I guess now he's ready to give it another try. So we wish him the best. He was always a little bit of a questionable take for Mississippi State, kind of a marginal guy, a tweener, shall we say, a guy that didn't have the length and maybe explosiveness to play defensive end, was going to have to bulk up and slide inside. And that's the thing you begin to kind of ask yourself. With all the moving parts to his development, maybe it wasn't a good idea to take him. But uh, this is a guy, obviously, that has had some real challenges in life, so we wish him the best. But not everybody can play in a Southeastern Conference. And that's the thing I think sometimes, too, and I'm not being critical of our staff. I think when you – maybe perhaps you've recruited to Washington State and then you get here in this neighborhood in which we live, I think there is an acclimation process that takes place for your coaches. I don't think maybe you know an SEC player when you see one until you've been around them for a couple of years. It's one of the things that everybody talks about. Well, I know I've played the SEC. Yeah, until you're here – until you kind of see how guys uh, develop and how they're recruited, I don't know that you really have a good grasp on that. And so there, again, there is this acclimation period for guys to kind of adjust. And so I, I think when I look at some of the guys that we offered early on, and, and many of those guys, of course, uh, are contributing now, but there's some other guys like Tamar Rogers, linebacker. I, I thought he was a questionable take. Great young man, no doubt. But again, the classic tweener. Doesn't have the foot speed to play safety. Doesn't have the size to play linebacker. So where do you play him? Well, you play Middle Tennessee State. That's where he's headed now. And uh, wish him the best as well. But you, you could see this spring, you know, he was sliding down the depth chart. And you've got uh, some newcomers at linebacker that are showing up that are more talented and probably maybe a little more uh, projectable at that position, if that's a phrase. You know, I think about this linebacker class with Javay Gilmore and Khalid Moore and Avery Sledge. Those guys were going to rapidly pass to Mar Rogers because they're more natural linebackers and they're better athletes. And so all of a sudden, I think Tamar Rogers kind of realizes that. And I don't know if somebody sat him down on the staff and said, listen, here's the reality of your situation. But this is the positive side of the portal. You have a guy like Tamar Rogers that is basically going to languish in obscurity here at Mississippi State, gets the opportunity to get on scholarship at Middle Tennessee State, a place that I believe that he can play and contribute. And Mississippi State gets that scholarship spot to give to somebody else. And so I think that is a good situation, too. I mean, the last thing we want are guys just to kind of hang around, eat up the scholarship roles, and then never have any meaningful playing time. But that's not a situation that benefits anybody. And the flip side of it is, on, uh, we talk about you know, the positive side of the portal. You know, look at what State has done with defensive back recruiting in this recruiting cycle. I mean, you go get Hunter Washington, who was a four-star at signed with Florida State. Uh, you, you get – uh, Morant from Michigan, it's a four-star. 
Last year, you got Jalen Green, who was a five-star. You got Marcus Banks, who was a four-star. Well, State was in also ran in their recruitments out of high school. But now they're looking to reboot their careers, and now you get them. And so now, all of a sudden, you've got a much more talented you know, secondary. And, of course, Jackie Matthews transfers in, and he's a four-star transfer. So you start looking at the numbers there. You know, State's been able to I, – I hate to use the term, but process perhaps some guys that were riding a roster that were never going to play here – and replace them with some guys who potentially can. And so, I, listen, I get it. I, I see all the complaints from you guys on social media about the portal. The, the reality of it is the portal is here to stay. Will there be some changes? Yes. Maybe not as quickly as we hoped. I mean, there's a lot of discussion about having the transfer windows, and there doesn't seem to be a lot of support for that to pass this year. So that is something we'll continue to consider. But, uh, you know, I, I think – what we have to do is kind of embrace the situation where we are and find a way to succeed. We can't just sit back and complain about the portal, you know, the portal, the portal, the portal. And, and here's the reality of it too. And I don't think a lot of people realize this uh, in, in years past when guys have elected to transfer that they, they've quit the team too. And I, I know using the term quit is not something that is maybe as politically correct today, but it's honest and accurate. And that's what we're going to call it. Guys quit. There are some guys that quit. Quite simply, they quit the team. And some of the guys who transferred into Mississippi State, they also quit the team. And so that's something you got to consider too. But, you know, back before we had the transfer portal, guys would just quit and you wouldn't know they were transferring until one day you look up and they're not on the sidelines anymore. And it's like, hey, Steve, what's going on? Well, he's transferring. It, you just didn't have the portal to make these public announcements about, about all this. But, um, you know, there are some guys that quit for one reason or another. Some guys quit because they know they're not going to play here. I'm not quitting the sport, but I'm quitting this team because I have no future here. And there are other guys that quit for other reasons. It's a reason guys are in the portal, and it's not always about playing time. I just made that point earlier over at jeanspage.com. It's not always about playing time. You know, some guys quit because they can't handle adversity. You know, some guys quit – because they're not willing to put in the work. I mean, there is a real sacrifice to play in a Southeastern Conference, and some people aren't willing to pay it. And so they quit. And I know there are some people out there that are wincing every time they hear the phrase, quit. And I'm going to keep using it. Guys quit. And sometimes they quit for good reasons, and sometimes they quit because they just, you know, they can't make it work for themselves. But that's the reality of life. People quit. It's, well, I really didn't quit. You know, no, 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 you quit. You quit. And that's something you've got to live with. And, and you can decide for yourself if it was justified or not. But, you know, but you quit. You made a commitment. You signed the document. And you quit. And so those are the things that I go back to. And I say, you know, with Steve, you know, sometimes situations change. And you're right about that. I mean, look at Makai Polk. I mean, he was a guy that was underutilized at Cal. So what does he do? He quits the team at Cal. And he joins our team here. He reboots his career, and it worked out really well for both parties. He should be back this year. He's not. He quit our team in hopes of going to the NFL. And so I said those things, and I know that I'll get messages, Steve, I think you're being too hard. No, I'm not. I'm, not. I'm being honest. You're being disingenuous. All right, let's thank our friends at Bulldog Burger Company. I love Bulldog Burger Company. I have it probably once every two weeks, sometimes once a week. Like when friends come in from out of town, they say, hey, we're going to be riding through town on business or whatever, or we're making a trip to the beach or whatever. Uh, hey, you want to get lunch? Let's go to that Bulldog Burger Company place you're always talking about. Well, let's do it because I'm always ready to go, and you will be too. And I guarantee you this, if you come home tonight or maybe you get in your group text with your family and say, hey, I'm thinking about going out to eat tonight. Where would you guys like to go? Bulldog Burger Company is going to be one of the top nominees as well it should be. Uh, if you're in Starkville too, they have opened this new patio area. Really, really cool. You can go by and check that out. And that's one good thing about, uh, listen, I know it gets hot, but sometimes eating outside is really cool. And now you can do that with a little more style at Bulldog Burger Company here in Starkville. Go by and check them out. Three great locations to serve your University Drive here in Star Vegas, Gloucester Street there in Tupelo, and the newest one, Lake Harbor Drive and the Ridgeland Flowood area. Have the spring rolls as your appetizer. It'll make you better looking. Get that great restaurant quality hamburger. It's one of the few delicacies in life we afford ourselves. It's affordable. It's delicious. It's filling. I've told you guys before, one of the best things about Bulldog Burger Company are the portions. You're never going to leave wanting more. 
That's us guaranteed. Never going to leave wanting more. Be sure and go check them out today. Bulldog Burger Company, the place where people go to meet. M-E-A-T. All right, by the time you're listening to this show, there will already have been the announcement about the Bulldog Balconies. You say, Steve, what are the Bulldog Balconies? Well, we're going to take some time on the show today. We're going to talk about that. There will be plenty of articles that are out today. The university will make a release. They'll have like a frequently asked questions thing. So I'm going to try to explain it as best I can. Me and several members of the media were kind of given a preview yesterday. Chance to go meet with Mike Ritchie and Red Hobart and many others. It was kind of about what's happening, what's the, the, the genesis of this project. And so from what I understand, the Bulldog Balconies, and they're just going to call them the Balconies, they're going to be in the west side and basically the outer reaches of the expanses of the west upper deck. And it's very rare that we sell those tickets. And the regular season ticket holders that were impacted by this new project have already been relocated. That They've actually been given upgraded seats, right? Because if you're at the far end of each upper deck, you're able to move in a little bit. You get a better vantage point. Uh, so what's going to happen now on, those, on the two ends up there? I guess it's uh, basically maybe six sections, I think. Um, there's this new, basically, standing room only area. And it's leveled, kind of like Kramer was talking about doing it with Seinfeld. He talked about levels, Jerry. Well, Mike Ritchie and the girl are really doing it. And this idea kind of came into play back in maybe October, that they work with Populous and a few other companies to kind of get some ideas, say, what can we do that's somewhat innovative, but also, too, provides a bit of a social element for our fans. And there, there have been some rumors out there and a lot of people you know, had some rumor and didn't have a lot of fact about, hey, what's it going to be like? What's well, going to be like the left field lounge? Okay, we're not doing any cooking up there. Nobody's going to have a grill. Nobody's going to have, um, you know, a fireworks display. And none, of that, none of that stuff, okay? Basically what it is is you're going to have an area that's kind of sectioned off. And if I remember correctly, I think the initial investment is 2700 bucks, and then you got to buy your tickets. But you'll have this area where you can just kind of walk around. There's a chair rail. There's a 42-inch uh, rail there, too, and you've got your little drink ledge there. So you can kind of stand there with friends and, you know, have a cold one and then enjoy your nachos and watch a ball game. And one of the things I think is really cool, it's really like for families. So, like – you know how it is right now. If you've got a family of four and you're kind of packed in the four little seats there and you've got small kids, they want to get up and move around. Well, they're going to be able to do that in the balconies. And you can say, but Steve, how safe is it? Tremendously. Tremendously. Again, you know, kids aren't going to be able to climb up over the top. You've got to watch your kids, obviously. But, but they're going to have, you know, mom's not going to have to sit there and miss a ball game constantly telling everybody to be steel and pinching legs and things like that. Now you say, well, Steve, it's standing room only. You're actually going to be able to bring chairs. And you can even bring bar stools. They have to be chained up, of course, you know, as a safety precaution. Like when you leave, you know, everything's got to be tied down. And each balcony is going to have basically kind of like a beach box where you can store stuff. And you can have a little refrigerator up there. How about that? That's cool. And you can service your balcony the Friday before a game just like you can your, your rig out at Duty Noble Field. You come up there on Friday – Get everything set up. You can put some beers in your fridge or some uh, Capri Suns, whatever your preference. And you can have snacks. You can kind of get all that stuff settled on Friday. You won't be able to bring stuff in on game day. You got to get it all serviced on Friday. And so these will go, I guess, the, the lower level balconies have eight, room for eight people. And it goes all the way up to, I guess, 22, maybe 28. And again, I'm doing all this from memory, so you have to forgive me. But basically, you're going to have this section on either side of the west upper deck that allows you to kind of gather in this area that has some shade, too. How cool is that? That's a nice little premium upgrade there. You can be in the upper deck and have a shaded area where you have a fridge and you have the access to snacks. Eventually, they'll probably have, like, there's, a, there's one little servicing area there and you'll see it in the renderings that everybody's kind of got to go is that got to go through this one area that may eventually become like a vending area that's not in the initial plans but eventually it could be but it's it's rather innovative and uh, one of the questions that i had for mike ritchie and, and our development team is 
Does anybody else in the country have this? And the answer to that question is no. Nobody has this. There are a few people out there like South Alabama that have something similar in end zones. They have like an SRO area in end zones. Well, we're taking it up in the upper deck. Now, we don't sell many of those tickets anyway. So there's not that many season ticket holders that are impacted by this. And as I mentioned before, those people have already been contacted. They've been upgraded. But what's cool about it, too, is is it's going to be one of those things, too, that I think a lot of people are going to look at and say, you know what? I think I want to do this. I want an area where I can kind of move around a little bit. I can go high-five my friends, and I have to reach across two rows of people. And so you have to – now, it's not going to be a situation, too, where you can just you know, bring everybody, all your friends can come up there. They have to have a ticket to sit in the balcony. This is a premium ticket area. It's going to be interesting to see how this whole thing kind of – that kind of comes to be because what if this thing takes hey bulldog business owners if you're like me i know exactly what my business needs sometimes it's difficult to find the right candidate today there's so many people out there in the job market making it so competitive it's almost like an interviewee's market maybe it's time to flip the script and bring in the hiring power of your friends at indeed Instead of spending hours upon hours on multiple job sites or combing through resumes for candidates that might not even have the right skills for you, Indeed's powerful hiring partnership can help you do it all. With Instant Match, over 80% of employers get quality candidates whose resume on Indeed matches their job description. The moment they sponsor a job, according to Indeed.com, you're going to get results. That's one of the best things about it. And here's the deal. Being a Boneyard listener, we're going to give you a little incentive to give our friends at Indeed a try. Start hiring now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash Boneyard. That offer is only good for a limited time. You can claim your $75 credit now at Indeed.com slash Boneyard. Indeed.com slash Boneyard. Some terms and conditions may apply, but we're here to help you find the right candidates to fill all the vacancies at your business. Hurry in to Mattress Firm's July 4th sale. Get a king bed for the price of a queen or a queen for a twin and save up to $500 on Sealy. Plus, get a free adjustable base with qualifying Sealy purchase, up to a $4.99 value. Or shop Tempur-Pedic, the most highly recommended bed in America, and save $500 on all Tempur-Breeze mattresses and get a $300 instant gift good towards sleep accessories. Only at Mattress Firm. Restrictions apply. See store or mattressfirm.com for details off what if people say you know what i love these and they sell out and uh, you're going to have the ability to kind of reserve one now they're going to start i think july 1st is when it starts maybe july 1st through the 5th and again i'm doing that from memory but um then all of a sudden we think well wait a minute let's do it on the other side too and so from what i understand it's going to reduce capacity at davis wade stadium by around 1900 or so and so our numbers are going to come down a little bit. So we're not going to be selling out of records, right, for attendance because we're bringing those numbers down. But I think this makes a more functional area, like for families, but also, too, like what if I buy the the, um, the balcony? What if I this is my year, I want to get the balcony, and maybe I want to get the bigger one because I'm going to have clients or friends or whatever that I'm not going to have season tickets for them. But I still want the bigger area because from time to time, I'm going to have a bigger crowd. Well, then you can just buy game day tickets for the balcony. You. Because you will have that, basically, that license to buy those tickets. And there's a cap, of course, for each section. But, you know, let's say one week you may have a dozen people there. And then the next week you may have 20 people there. So you're not going to be limited. You're not going to be able to force to buy more tickets than you, than you need. Uh, but the reality of it is, is once you have that seat license, you, know, you can buy the tickets that you need for your balcony kind of week to week. You're going to have to have, I think the minimum requirement is eight, but then you can each week as you need to, you can add more game tickets provided you don't exceed your capacity. I hope it's not too confusing. And I think once you guys see the renderings, you're going to be pretty excited too. <clears throat> let, me, let me give you probably the best, the best description we talk about it being like left field lounge. You know those that second row of rigs out there? That's probably the best example I can give. You have the little, uh, you know, the stairwell that goes up there, and then you're in your, your area. You're basically going to have these things stacked 
in the bleachers. And they, they started this morning at 4 a.m. They brought a crane in, and, and, crane in. and uh, the framework itself already been prefabbed. It's ready to go. So you'll probably see some activity out there at Davis Wade Stadium if you're in Starkville on campus, and you're going to say, what's going on over there? Well, that's going on. There's actually two cranes there now. There's one crane that's working on uh, replacing those panels in the video board. And I understand that uh, it's going to be better than ever and that we got more life out of that video board than most people do. We, you know, I think the life of it is, uh, what, uh, six or seven years. We got eight to ten. I can't remember the exact, exact number. But uh, we'll have a story kind of explain unless Robbie's got a story together that we'll run over at jeanspage.com. And, of course, the university will have a relief release. But when you see these renderings, I think you're going to look at it and say, number one, it's better than I expected it to be. It is for me. Because when I first heard about all this, I'm thinking – Okay, how are we going to make this work? Where, where are people going to dispose of burning charcoal? You know, I mean, it's like, it, we're going to bring the left field lounge up to the west side upper deck? You know, so we got the, some clarity yesterday. So you're going to have the social atmosphere of the lounge, but we're not going to have fires up there, right? So it's going to be an area, again, where you can just kind of go and congregate and hang with friends. And uh, as I mentioned, it is at its core, an SRO only deal, but you can bring chairs and then you can store them from game to game. That, that's a cool thing too. So you're thinking, Steve, every week I got to drag, you know, six bar stools up there. No, you don't. You go up there in service at game one, the Friday before the game, you bring a cable and you lock all your stuff down when you leave, because the last thing we need is, you know, tornado coming through here and, you know, taking your chairs all over the greater Starkville area. So there will be some constraints about all that. You know, there's going to be safety issues. And that's one of the questions that I had from Mike Ritchie. What are, you, what are your safety concerns with all of this? And, of course, you know, they've talked to, you know, legal people and insurance people and all the people that kind of assess risk and, and, and made this a very safe venture. Now, you're going to be able to also kind of tailor your spot a little bit, some, you know, within reason. You know, and so I think it's important to understand that, too. I mean, th this could be a very unique situation. And one of the things I want to do, too, is I really want to applaud, you know, our administration for kind of being forward thinking here. Nobody else has this. And, and you know, if it really takes off, maybe we should do more of this. You know, maybe we reduce capacity, but we add more functionality to the stadium. We hadn't had a sellout in a long time. And some of that's COVID related, some of it's football related, and some of it too is people are just, you know, people are just staying home. It's more fun to stay home, and you know, maybe these got these outdoor kitchens and TVs outside, or you know, projectors and screens, or whatever. And sometimes we just get twenty and thirty of our best friends, and we sit around and drink beer at my house around the pool and watch a ball game. And you know what? That's a blast. But we want to get people back into Davis Wade Stadium, and so hey, let's do something a little bit different. We can't keep doing the things we've always done and expect to get different results. And so I applaud them for trying something different. Will this be something you look at and say, hey, this is something that I want to do all the time? Maybe. Maybe it is. I think you're going to have some people that are going to get up there and absolutely love the fact there's a little more, you know, mobility. You know, instead of being packed in there like sardines, you know, you think, hey, I can get up and walk around. I can get over there. And if I want to talk to, to Brian for a minute, then I get, I'm tired of talking to Brian. I can go talk to Robbie for a minute. You know, you can move around a little bit. Uh, so I think this is something that the first year will, that will probably be a learning process like it always is. But it's going to be something very unique to Davis Wade Stadium. It's going to get a lot of media attention when it's released today because people are going to wonder how this thing is going to work. And then I think some other people around the country are looking at it and say, you know what, maybe we should do something similar. Or maybe we should take Mississippi State's idea and maybe approve upon that. And so – Again, I think, again, it's one of those things you look at your administration, they're always trying to find something new. Uh, one of the things, that, and Mike Nemeth and I talked about this yesterday, there have been so many times in the past that, you know, Mississippi State, we have these grand designs. This is what we're going to do. This is what our, our deal is. And we want to do this and be excited about it. And then cost becomes an issue. One of the things that I have learned in the John Cohen era is that we're not going to do it if we can't do it right. If we can't do it right, we'll just wait. We're not going to go do it. We're not going to start out thinking, okay, all right, we're going to have this great 
dining hall with these hardwood floors and we're going to have incredible furniture in there and it's going to be something that's just unlike anything else and so we get all excited and we start dreaming and then all of a sudden you know when the estimates start coming in and we start talking to contractors well in the end we end up having you know press board furniture or we end up throwing down some laminate floor you know it's like i'm just so glad we're not the mississippi state of old that kind of feel like, well, good enough is good enough. Because if that was the case, nothing would truly ever be good enough. I think we deserve to have the best, at least the best that we can afford. And I don't think we have to come out here and say, okay, well, let me go borrow all this money and um, you know, go beg for money. And it's not what we expect it to be or what we deserve to have. But this is something different. You know, I don't know how it's going to go over. I think it's a good idea. Again, I think it's an area you don't ordinarily sell tickets anyway. So let's make that a little more attractive. Let's provide a different experience and see if that gets people in the stadium. You know, we're going to have our core group, right? I mean, there are some of you guys that are going to come to football games no matter who the coach is, no matter what the record is, because you love Mississippi State. You love being able to socialize with friends. So the balconies is going to be something that is completely – foreign to what we've had before but at the same time too it's not a fly-by-night type deal it's not like okay we joked yesterday we we joked yesterday about Rhett I love Rhett Hobart to death the dude's awesome so glad that he's back but uh it's like yeah we only started this like Rhett got back Rhett came home so we decided to do this now again this is something that's been in development for a while and when the time it's all finished they'll finish uh mid-august or so and we're supposed to get a tour then, and we'll go up there and get you guys some pictures. That's the plan anyway. Um, but it's not something that just, you know, all of a sudden, hey, let's just throw this stuff up and just see if it works. There's been a lot of thought. There's been a lot of planning in all of this. And it's really about giving you guys a different experience, a different experience here at Davis Wade Stadium giving you a different ticketing option. And there are a lot of people out there that maybe are just, and I was a sky dog at one time too. It's like, hey, well, maybe I want a little bit more than this. And I, I think having that shaded area up there is great. In fact, that you also too can, uh, can bring snacks and kind of service your own area. I think that's one of those things you look at and say, okay, well, this is something I've never done before. So let me try it. Let me try it. And I'm interested to see how quickly they sell. You know, if you look at that like that cabana era up there area up there, excuse me. You know, when we first rolled that thing out, a lot of people were like, "Well, you know, how's this going to work?" Well, those people are always milling around up there. They got somewhere to put their stuff. They got somewhere to get out of the shade, but they're kind of interacting and kind of moving around and mingling with other people. Well, this kind of gives you that aspect too. So it'll be interesting to, again to kind of see how this is embraced from people. And now, if you're one of those people, too, that are going to sit on the west side upper deck, your view of the stadium is not going to be impeded. In no way. Like, that's one of the things the engineers did when they came in. It, it, like, these balconies are kind of set at an angle so, so as not to interrupt the sight lines of the people that are sitting in the bleachers. So all of that has been considered. So, again, you'll read about it on jeanspage.com. You can see the official release. And when you see those renderings, I think you're going to look at it and say, well, this is interesting. This is interesting. It may not be for you. And it, outside of the first row, it's not handicapped accessible. Okay, so that's something to consider too. And and more times than not, our, our uh, Bulldogs that um, need a wheelchair or perhaps a, uh, uh, a mobility device, you know, they have a, a section for those folks already. You know, they have good sight lines or whatever. So this is not really for you. Uh, but it is basically going to be placed on what we have already. It's not going to require any major engineering or things like that to change the upper deck. We're basically just going to – all those bleachers have been pulled out, and then today all of the framework has been put in. And, again, about eight weeks, about eight weeks, seven to eight weeks, I guess, they'll be done with this, and then you guys can see it. And, you know, the renderings are always perfect, right? And about the only thing that we've done exactly to the renderings has been – Dirty Noble Field, but again, I think if you know John, you know, we're not going to cut back here. If we put something out there and say, hey, this is our plan, then that's what we're going to do. We're going to implement that plan rather than scale it back. And so uh, I think they, it's like a couple million dollars this thing's going to cost. 
you'll see all that out there today. Again, I didn't take good notes yesterday, but I wanted to be able to explain it to you as best I can. And it's hard to kind of visually explain something that's unlike anything you've really ever seen before. But again, it's like that second row of rigs basically kind of cascading down the upper deck on the east, on the west side, both left and the right side. So you'll have those you know, with that nice handrail going all the way up, and you'll have your open area there where you can uh, have the shaded area and people can kind of move around and congregate uh, in the area. So again, it's, it's very different than what you've seen in years past. So maybe Mississippi State's on the uh, – on the cusp of doing something that's uh, unlike anything else in the country. So, again, tip of the cap to everybody involved, and uh, good luck selling these things, and hopefully it brings something very unique and special to Davis Wade Stadium. All right, let's get into today's top ten list. And, uh, of course, as always, brought to you by CloseWithBlair.com. That's C-L-O-S-E with Blair, B-L-A-I-R. Dot com. And if you, you can't remember that, hit me up. I'm happy to supply the, the link for you. Blair Chandler is a mortgage professional and a lifelong bulldog. Has a place here in Starkville, a season ticket holder in multiple sports, a guy that loves Mississippi State, wants to do what he can to kind of keep it in the family, but also to offer some incredible mortgage lending services to people of all persuasions. Blair is a guy that has been in the industry for 21 years. It's a competitive market. A lot of people out there want your business. Blair's a guy that deserves it. Works for Fairway Mortgage, recently voted number one in customer satisfaction when it comes to mortgage origination. Maybe you've gotten uh, overextended. Maybe some revolving debt that was incurred during the quarantine has really made life difficult. How about consolidating that debt to one low monthly payment that's also in, that's, uh, interest or tax deductible? That interest is tax deductible for you. And maybe the dream of home ownership has eluded you. You say, you know, Steve, I just can't. I just can't get my hopes up again. I just can't do it. Well, if Blair can't do it, it probably can't be done. He's a guy that's seen it all and done it all. Let me encourage you. Give him a chance to help you. He can review your situation and get you pre-qualified. Okay, this is what you can afford. This is the kind of house that you're looking for. And that helps. It takes a lot of guesswork out of it. Blair's phone number, his personal cell. 601-500-2344. 601-500-2344. Again, 601-500-2344. Mention to him you heard about him on the boneyard. He's going to pay for your appraisal. That's a great value. It's about 500 bucks. Right out of the gate, a lot of fees associated with getting a mortgage. And right out of the gate, he's saving you some money. That's the plan. Close with Blair.com. C-L-O-S-E with Blair. B-L-A-I-R.com. All right, so Roy hit me up yesterday, and he goes, I can't believe it, but we've never done Limp Biscuit. We'd like to thank our friend Dr. Hunter Butler. That's right. We have a very distinguished listenership here at the Boneyard. Dr. Hunter Butler reached out to Roy and said, hey, what about Limp Biscuit?" And Roy searches the archives and says, hey, we've never done this. We double-checked Spotify list. We double-checked our spreadsheet. We've never done Limp Bizkit. Now, Limp Bizkit, six albums, and they've sold over 40 million records. An innovative band. And I'll be honest with you guys, too. I was somewhat reluctant to get on the new metal bandwagon. I was. I, I didn't really like the fusion that it brought in many respects. Now, I'm a guy, too. I loved Anthrax's work with Public Enemy. But Bring the Noise, I thought that was one of the more important songs in my generation. Loved what Run DMC and uh, Aerosmith did with Walk This Way. It's like, it's like, the, it's like an all-star type performance. But New Metal was one of those things. I was like, I don't know. I don't know because basically you had like a you know, heavy metal riff and then kind of like a, a rap bass line and then there was some singing and some rap elements in it. So I just I really wasn't ready for that. It didn't take me long to get on the bandwagon with corn, though. But I thought Limp Biscuit initially, I thought, was a little silly. And then the album Significant Other came out, and my feelings about them changed. And how many, I mean, that's the thing you think about, too, is like, you know, how many people could be that wrong? Now, Limp Biscuit, of course, is not remembered in many respects in perhaps the same reverence that bands like corn are. 
And a lot of it's got to do with Woodstock. You know, they basically incited a riot there. And it's like all of a sudden they made all these enemies in the record industry. And people were like, you know what? We're done with these guys. Uh, Wes Borland, I think, is a musical genius. I love his look. I love the fact that he is a guy that uh, never takes himself too seriously. One of the things that's really cool, too, about Wes Borland, I don't know if you know this. I mean, maybe, we, maybe we touched about this on the show before. But there were these two high school kids. They were, like, playing at some talent show. And they wrote Wes Borland a letter and asked Wes to play with him, and he did. Just went to the show, played, and uh, the two kids were huge Limp Bizkit fans. One of the guys was a bass player. The guy was a drummer. They didn't have a guitar player. So what do they do? They go to Wes. And Wes shows up, again, shows a guy that doesn't take himself too seriously, not too big to do things like that. And you hear about that occasionally. But what a dream that had to be for those high school kids to have – Wes Borland from Limp Bizkit on stage at their show. So tip of the cap to you, Wes. And Wes has done some other things, too. He's not just limited to Limp Bizkit. He's done a lot of other crazy stuff. But uh, this is the guy that puts on an incredible show. So here are some songs that didn't make the list. Three of them are covers because you know my policy, right? The song My Generation is the only original piece that didn't make the top ten, but I wanted to throw an honorable mention in its direction. Their cover of George Michael's Faith was one of the things that really kind of made them stars on MTV. It's different. It's like you take this very benign pop song and you made it a new metal song. Interesting. They had a hit a few years back with a cover of uh, The Who's Behind Blue Eyes. Really showed a different side of themselves. Top 20 hit. On the Greatest Hits album, they also do a a cover of Motley's Home Sweet Home. Not a huge fan of it, but I got to get a tip of the cap for anybody that will cover some Motley. I'm still upset that I didn't get to see Motley last week. Me and the homie Sam were supposed to go. We've been planning this for two years, had conflicts, and I would like, hey, well, I got to go on the ship. And then we didn't get to go on the ship, so I missed the cruise and the Motley Crew show. I will be going with Roy, however, in November to see Judas Priest in Queensryche at the Lander Center in South Haven. So if you haven't heard about that, tickets go on sale on Thursday. That's right. I've never seen Priest. I never have. Can't wait. Can't wait to go. And still kicking around the idea of going to Nashville uh, next month to go see uh, Faster Pussycat, L.A. Guns, and Tom Kiefer. I know those guys in Faster Pussycat. So I may go check those guys out. And uh, Ace Van Johnson. Um a guy that I think does a lot of good things. Not just a, good, a rock guy, but uh, raises a lot of money for, uh, for animals. Real involved with pits. Like, he, he raises money every year. Like, he'll sell merchandise to help for pit relief, like for pit bulls. Because, um, you know, a lot of people out there mistreat those dogs and their issues. I would never have a pit bull, but I respect those that, that love them. But here, in my estimation, are your top ten Limp Bizkit songs. If you don't know, maybe you should. All right, number 10, it's in together now. And this is one of those where they basically just decided, hey, we're not just going to be kind of like rock rap. We're going to really embrace it here. And um, I'm pulling this thing up here. In Together Now is one of these songs, too, that I think Method Man is on there, who I think is one of the greatest rappers in the history of the world. I don't think there's any question. Method Man, his delivery, unlike anybody else's. Love it. So in together, now that, that was off Significant Other, and it was really kind of a precursor for some things to come. And I think it gave Limb Biscuit some credibility in the rap community, but also, too, it, it reintroduced, you know, some incredible rappers to the rock community, where it was kind of like, hey, it's okay to like both. You know, we don't have to be segregated by style here or by race, we can enjoy this music. And I think in many respects, new metal really, in some ways, kind of killed off the rock scene. I think a lot of people realized, hey, you can rock and you can rap together and you can make something really cool. And I think the younger generation of rock fans really embraced that. And I think rap really benefited from it as well because there were a lot of people that didn't know Wu-Tang. And all of a sudden you hear Method Man, you're like, well, who is this guy? What's his story? Well, the next thing you know, we're listening to Wu-Tang Clan. So, good effort there. All right, number nine from the album Gold Cobra. And this is one of the only songs kind of later in the catalog. 
is the title track from that album, Gold Cobra. I like it. It's very rocky. It's uh, kind of a return to form in many respects. Gold Cobra, I think, a really cool track from them. And it was, you know, it was, it was a comeback. A lot of people are like, oh, are they really doing another album? And yes, they did do another album, and it's really good. It, it's different from the earlier stuff. I think it's important to kind of understand that. It is different from the earlier stuff. This album actually got pretty good reviews. It was a fifth studio album from Limp Bizkit and, uh, on Interscope, and it was the first since 2003. So it had been eight years between albums. You know, results may vary is the one, and that and results may vary is the one that had behind blue eyes on there. But uh, not the same level of success, but critically acclaimed, probably a little bit better. Probably a little bit better when it's all said and done. But I, I think again, if if you like the old Limp Biscuit, I think you'll like this one. Uh, again, the album did not really sell exceptionally well, but I think it's uh, it was a good one. And uh, they didn't do another album again until a couple of years ago. But, uh, again, a lot of people out there like Limp Bizkit maybe haven't listened to anything, um, you know, since the heyday. Okay, number seven, we're going back to the beginning, back when uh, Fred Durst and those guys were living in Jacksonville, Florida, just trying to figure this thing out. It's off the $3 bill, y'all, album. It's Counterfeit. Counterfeit is a great track. And, I th- honestly, I think if Limp Bizkit had maybe remained on that, that track, that trajectory would counterfeit. I think a lot of people, I think they probably would still be making music today that people were still very um, very serious about. Now, they may not have been as influential at the time, and maybe the trajectory of the career would have been different, but I think it would maybe have been a little more longstanding. But Counterfeit, an outstanding song. Number six, it's rearranged. And I don't know that this song... It was a single, but I don't know they got It's Just Due. This is another one, too, that I think uh, is kind of hiding like a snake in the reeds. When you listen to that album in its entirety, this one kind of stands out to me. I think it's one of those ones that, um, while they got some radio airplay, probably should have done better. And I I think in some respects, too, to be fair, I think there was some Limp biscuit fatigue because they come from nowhere, and it seemed like MTV and rock radio was kind of like forcing them down our throats. And then eventually, like, okay, well, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. But they were everywhere. It's like you couldn't have a festival without them. You couldn't have a, an award show without them. And I think, again, there was some fatigue. I think one of the things you have to do is kind of make people miss you from time to time, especially in the music industry. And so I think some of their the deeper tracks and maybe later singles that maybe weren't pushed as heavily by MTV and rotation maybe didn't get the notoriety they perhaps deserved. Number five. Off the Mission Impossible soundtrack. I love this song. I do. I, I just can't push it ahead of the, the, the major hits. But it's Take a Look Around. I love the guitar on it. Of course, it's got that Mission Impossible vibe to it. It is one of their better songs. I think Fred does a really good job on it. But to me, musically, I think that's what really sets this song apart. Many of you have probably have forgotten about that. And all of a sudden you hear it, you go, oh, yeah, I remember this. It was great. Okay, so... Number four and number three, we're going to have a first in top ten uh, segment history. We're going to have the same song, two different versions of the same song. And they're very, very different versions. And really the only thing that is the same is, is basically the chorus. And so the number four song on our list is Limp Bizkit's Rolling Urban Assault Vehicle. You're like, Steve, what's the difference? Well, I'll tell you the difference. You got some of the greatest rappers in the history of the world that uh, were part of this production. And I was actually working in the furniture industry back then, and so I'd get back there and, uh, you know, and, and work with those guys in the warehouse, and i put this album on. Next thing I know, everybody's wanting to burn a copy of it. You know, those are the things that you think about. You know, it kind of brings people together. You know, the, the contrast in styles, I think, really exposes listeners to some things perhaps that they – are unfamiliar with, but also too, I think there are some people that uh, maybe have n- would never have heard of Limp Biscuit had it not been for the Limp Biscuit Urban Assault Vehicle track. It also features DMX, Method Man, and Red Man. And again, you know, I think Method Man again is the truth. But uh, the DMX verse on this is ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. And um, Red Man's verse is really good too. You know, he's the uh, the kissing cousin of the Wu Tang Clan, but the baseline on this, the track is different. It hits really hard in the car. All right, number three, 
is the rolling air raid vehicle. Maybe that's something we should adopt, being that we're an air raid school. I absolutely loved it. I think it's one of those things, too, that uh, I heard this one first. And then when I, you know, they came out, I remember when uh, Fred Durst was being interviewed before they released uh, the Chocolate Starfish and the Hot Dog Flavored Water is a third album. He's like, hey, we got this. And they were basically playing it on a boom box. I mean, technology was so, I guess you could say basic at its time. Like you couldn't play something off a recorded album and then have it on MTV at the time because it hadn't been released yet. It was pretty crazy. So they would play it, and then there's like a microphone up to the boom box, and you hear it, and you kind of get an idea how things are going to go. But the Roland uh, Air Raid vehicle, a huge hit. And again, I, I couldn't put one or the other on this list because the songs are so different, and I think they're, they're brilliant in their own ways. All right, number two, and at times, this has been my favorite Limp Bizkit song. This is probably, like, if I want to listen to Limp Bizkit, this is probably the first song that I put on, more times than not. It's Break Stuff. And I love the video, how they, they basically put out a casting call to their fans, and it's like, hey, we're going to be shooting a video here. If you're a fan, come by. You're going to be in the video. And, and like, to the people that are in the video with Limp Bizkit, the guys, the people, the, the guys and gals that were doing the, the lip syncing are fans. And again, I think it's Limp Bizkit kind of embracing where they've come from, too. At the time, they hadn't gotten too big for their britches. But uh, Break Stuff is one of those. So there's just so many killer lines in that track. You know, the first one to complain leaves with a blood stain. That's right. Because you know I'm like a chainsaw. I love it. I love it. I could listen to it every day. I love the aggression in it. Uh, I, I'm a guy, too, that... Uh, yeah, music kind of helps me heal. So sometimes maybe when I'm in a bad mood or whatever, I can put this song on and kind of allows me to vent out some of that negative emotion. Break Stuff, to me, a legendary track. But number one, what else could it be? It's the first major hit for Limp Bizkit. And uh, probably truer words never sung in recorded history. It's uh, the song Nookie. I did it all for the Nookie. Uh, so... There are a lot of people today that maybe only know Limp Bizkit from the first couple tracks, the number one, number two, maybe three tracks. I would encourage you to get to know the rest of the catalog, especially Wes Borland's musical genius. He is a very aggressive guitar player that uh, puts on an incredible show. Uh, Fred Durst is a guy that has been very polarizing in, in music circles for many years. A lot of people, again, didn't like the fact that they were so abrasive in kind of what they did. I, I like the fact they were somewhat unapologetic and really kind of had a punk rock vibe in their attitudes, not necessarily in their musical stylings, but uh, they were a band that kind of did things their way. And um, again, I think I may have skipped a song here. So let me run them down for you real quick here. In Together, number 10. Go Cobra, number 9. My Way, number 8. I don't think I talked about My Way. Number 7, Counterfeit. 6, Rearranged. 5, Take a Look Around. 4, Rolling Urban Assault Vehicle. 3, Rolling air raid vehicle, two break stuff, one nookie. Yeah, I think I skipped my way. I think so. But even if I didn't, we'll give it another tip of the cap. I'm sitting there thinking they're doing it their ways. And I'm like, oh, I didn't think about my way. But that's your top 10. So I apologize if I got out of order. If you have ideas for the top 10 list, reach out and let me know. Better yet, hit up Roy. And again, if you're looking for somebody too with 30 years of experience in quality management, uh, Roy's your guy. Roy recently found out that uh, the plant that he works at is closing. And uh, still has several years to go before he can retire. But he's a very experienced and well-educated Mississippi State grad. Does a lot to help us here at the show. And, of course, the salary with which we pay him, which is nothing, uh, is not enough to sustain life as our Spotify um, expert here for the top ten list. So Roy does a great job for me. Roy is my friend. And so if you, if you want to help me, you help Roy. So, again, Roy is at Twitter at Dogmatic67, D-A-W-G-M-A-T-I-C-6-7, also on Spotify. Follow him on both. Follow him on both. And, again, this is a guy with 30 years of experience out there uh, just kind of making things happen and, again, kind of figuring out the next step. He'll land on his feet, so you, you're going to miss the opportunity to get a quality employee and a guy that's a great bulldog that will do a great job for you. Uh, for the next several years. So, again, I know it's a competitive job market right now. Not many people have that same level of expertise or experience. Uh, so please uh, reach out to Roy. Let him know if you have an interest level. And, you know, it's like 
with all this experience, I know he'll find something. I know he'll land on his feet. But uh, anything that I can do to help my friend, I want to be able to do here on the show. All right, time for us to move on. And let, let's talk a little college baseball. You know, you know what I forgot to do? And again, this has become kind of a thing, I guess. We didn't do the prime strength player of the game. We didn't have a game, and maybe that's why I forget sometimes. But our prime strength player of the game is Mike Ritchie. That's right, Mississippi State Associate AD Mike Ritchie in charge of ticketing at Mississippi State. Uh, one of the people that was really a part of the leadership group to get this uh, new Bulldog balcony thing together. That's kind of his thing. You know, and, and I, I applaud Mike for his uh, service to Mississippi State. And, you know, n- not a nicer guy at Mississippi State, let's be honest. And, and I always applaud him the way he handles problems. You know, Mike's a guy, too, that never really gets elevated emotionally, at least not publicly. I remember back you know, a few years ago, I guess it was 15, we played Alabama, and uh, I had to go pick up some tickets for some friends. And uh, had them at Will Call, went to go pick them up, and there's some people that had been scammed and bought tickets from a scammer and then they're not able to get access to the stadium and they're up there and complaining and there's Mike Ritchie representing Mississippi State with an even temper being very very courteous these are Alabama fans okay these are not future season ticket holders right but he handled things professionally I don't know how it ended up but I know that he took a very emotional situation where a guy feels like I spent all this money on these tickets and I can't get into the game and then Mike handles it in such a way that the, the guy's able to calm down a little bit. I mean, that's the thing, too. You know, de-escalating a situation like that takes a, a true professional. Mike Ritchie, one of the unsung heroes on the Mississippi State campus. So, Mike, today it's for you. The Prime Shrimp.com player of the game is Mike Ritchie. Now, Prime Shrimp, if you're looking for great shrimp, look no further than Prime Shrimp. The, the, the great taste, the great service without all the fuss and cleanup of store-bought shrimp. Yeah, you can run down to your local place and get some shrimp. No idea how long they've been there. Not sure how fresh they are or whatever. Then you got to peel them. you got to devein them. you got to take tails off. And you sometimes still get that gamey taste. Maybe not exactly what you're looking for. With Prime Shrimp, you get a money-back guarantee. The shrimp show up in a Mississippi summer-proof container. They're in these handy little pouches that fit conveniently in your freezer. You take them out when you're ready to use them. You put on a pot of water. You boil it. You drop that shrimp in, 10 minutes later, you're ready to eat. It feels like you're eating down at uh, you know, Cafe Sabiza, Decatur Street in the quarter. Get that French Quarter, Alfredo, you'd be glad you did. Again, Louisiana Shrimp Bowl, is that, that, that may be my rising favorite. you got four great flavors to choose from right now. Visit them at primeshrimp.com and use promo code BONEYARD. That'll get to save you 20 bucks off your first order. So we're basically just kind of giving you some shrimp. Money, uh, free shipping on all orders over four pounds. And maybe that's the direction you want to go. And maybe you say, Steve, let me just try it and then we'll see. Let me tell you this. I don't know who does the cooking in your family, but this is going to be so delicious and so convenient. You're going to want to continue to do business with PrimeShrimp.com. PrimeShrimp.com, promo code Boneyard. Be sure and check them out today. All right, let's talk some college baseball. Time to get up to speed on what's what we're down to now. Not much baseball left. Sadly, we're not a part of it. Doesn't mean we're not impacted by it. A lot I want to say about this. This segment is show brought to you by CampusBookmart.net. I love CampusBookmart.net. You will too. If you haven't been by the store, it's very easy to find. It's on the backside of campus. You come in on 182, turn at the uh, Highway Patrol office, make your way towards campus, and there it is on the left. Uh, the lovely, talented Susie still holding it down. Miss Kathy Brown, best buyer in the market for sure. Anything out there with the Mississippi State logo on it, she can get it or already has it in stock. Go by and see their smiling faces. If you can't, visit them at campusbookmart.net. And by being a loyal Boneyard listener, we'll give you a phrase that pays. That is BSR, which stands for Beautiful Steve Robertson. And that gets you free shipping on all orders over 50 bucks. Any order less than 50 bucks, absolutely incomplete. And it's time, too, to be thinking of a football season. I know we're in vacation mode. And maybe get some new Mississippi State merch to wear on vacation. Everybody deserves that. Uh, mom or dad both need a uh, new M over S cap. You need to get some shirts for the fall. Be thinking about that. Be glad you did. Campusbookmart.net. Again, promo code BSR. All right. Let's talk college baseball. Let's look at what happened yesterday. We love college baseball here on the show. We do. And uh, I know you guys do too. Many of you guys are kind of keeping in touch with it because like, you're just hoping Ole Miss will lose. And listen, hey, those guys are playing well. You know, what can you say? We talked about them beginning of the year. I said, hey, we need to work, be welcome. 
warm up to the fact that these guys are going to have a good team, didn't think they had the pitching to pull it off, but thought they would be in contention for a top eight national seed and potentially get to Omaha, and here we are. And, and who would have thought that after that series we played them in Oxford? We win that series, and it seemed like we were on top of the world, and they were all ready to fire Mike Bianco. It's like, hey, this thing is done. And now we're at home, dead last in the West, and they're in the Final Four of Omaha. It's funny how life works out. It is a long season. College baseball is a long season. I don't think there's anybody in Oxford wanting to fire Mike Bianco right now. But I'm sure there's some malcontent out there saying, well, we just got lucky this year. No, nah, you didn't. You're just kind of playing up to your potential. So yesterday, Notre Dame eliminated. Uh, and listen, give Notre Dame some credit. Second time they've been to Omaha in forever and a day. A&M, though. I mean, A&M, A&M was the seventh team in the West last year. They're in the Final Four. The Final Four. We're, we're going to have a couple of good games today. a and is going to take on Oklahoma. Now, Oklahoma's been kind of lying in wait. Oklahoma, of course, beat A&M in game one, 13-8. And then Oklahoma wins the winner's bracket game against Notre Dame. They've been sitting there resting for two days. They had nothing Monday and Tuesday. And then, of course, Oklahoma. Then uh, yesterday, Notre Dame and A&M get together. A&M wins that thing going away 10-2. to So A&M has to beat Oklahoma twice. Oklahoma needs to win one to advance to the national championship final. A lot of people, and I'm, I'm one of them, I, I didn't think Oklahoma would get out of the regional. I know they won the Big 12 tournament. But they were headed down to Gainesville. And listen, I don't know what's happened to Florida. I mean, honestly, what is going on at Florida? You know, why aren't they better? I mean, you give our facilities and our stadium and our fan base and our support and our commitment to college baseball with that kind of recruiting footprint, we'll make LSU look like the Bad News Bears, man. It doesn't make any sense. And I know there's pro sports out in Florida, so, you know, loyalties are somewhat divided. But there's just no need for this. Come on, Florida. Get it together. Come on, Sully. But Oklahoma goes down there and wins that regional, and then then now here they are in the driver's seat in their side of the bracket at Omaha, a win away from playing for a national championship. Have you guys looked at Oklahoma this year? I mean, like you look at that pitch and you think, this is kind of crazy. You know, how did these guys kind of fly under the radar? Well, they did in certain respects. You know, they still were expected to be a good team this year. To say they've overcome maybe perhaps uh, expectations is probably accurate. 44-22 and 22 overall. They went 15-9 and nine in the conference. Winning record everywhere. 19-8 and eight at home, 10-7 and seven away, 15-7 and seven on a neutral field. And, of course, that counts all this. But, you know, you go back to the beginning of the year, they played in that State Farm College Baseball Showdown. They beat Auburn and got absolutely destroyed by Arizona. Then they beat Michigan. But you go back and look. I mean, that that tournament proved to be a very good one. Again, you know, great effort, you know, by the organizers down there. But, you know, this is a team, too. You get you get a little bit deeper in the year, and it's like, okay, they, they kind of begin to find their groove a little bit. They went and took two out of three from Texas Tech and Lubbock. You start thinking, okay, maybe these guys are getting it together. And they did. You know, it's like they so they were thirty three and twenty at the end of the regular season. Just kind of you know, hey, just kind of out there, you know. And the Texas Tech at the time was fifth in the country. And they take two out of three down there and end up with the same conference record. And so they get into the Big Twelve tournament, and they sweep the whole way through. They take down West Virginia. They beat Texas Tech again. That's the third time in four games. They beat Kansas State, and then they get Texas in the uh, in the championship game, and they win that one too. And all these games are competitive with the exception of the Texas game. They get into the regional at Gainesville, and they destroy Liberty, as we expected. And then they beat Florida, and then they lose to Florida to force a winner-take-all game, and they eat that one out 5-4 on Monday. And then you go to Virginia Tech, and I think we all felt like Virginia Tech was one of the, one of the more vulnerable top eight national seeds. And they win that thing two out of three. And now here we are, when you look at these guys in the postseason, they've dropped two games in the postseason. Two. That's it. And, of course, now here they are a game away. So interesting, interesting season for Oklahoma. A lot of people are thinking, hey, this team may be the hottest. I don't know that I agree. But they're a really good team and their pitching staff is outstanding. So they'll take on Texas A&M today, this afternoon. It's your afternoon matinee. Tonight, it's Ole Miss and Arkansas. 
Now, if you know, raise your hand if you had Ole Miss in the Final Four two months ago. Ole Miss hasn't lost in the postseason, with the exception of the SEC tournament. You know, when they, they go one and done in an SEC tournament, you're thinking, oh, this is it. And it was a, not, a lot of, you know, craziness that happened around them. And let me say this again for the record. If we're going to take nine SEC teams, and we certainly should, we're the best conference in America, Ole Miss was the ninth best team in the conference. Well, what does that say about our conference, that the ninth best team in the conference is a win away from playing for an NFL championship? Three of the four teams remaining – from the SEC, from the SEC West specifically. And listen, I see all these people. Well, Oklahoma's going to be – that that doesn't mean anything right now because Oklahoma didn't play an SEC schedule. I know it's cute to talk about all that, but, you know, they didn't play an SEC schedule, so we can't claim them until they do. I'm interested to go up there and watch them play baseball, though. I mean, I'm looking forward to making that trip to to Norman to cover baseball and to Austin for that matter. But uh, Ole Miss playing really well. And, of course, yesterday, Arkansas had to go take on Auburn. And, uh, you know, Auburn just kind of ran out of gas. Auburn had trouble scoring runs uh, in the College World Series. But, listen, look at Butch Thompson, man. Two trips to Omaha, you know, in three years, three full seasons. That's our guy, man. They're the pride of Amory, Mississippi. Really excited about uh, Butch. And, you know, my hope is the folks at Auburn – will put some money behind that baseball program. They don't really support it. They really don't. Uh, I, I was told that uh, Butch had to go out there and kind of raise his own money for an equipment shed they built. You know, I mean, wh- why does that happen? I mean, honestly, why does that happen at a place like Auburn? Butch got it done, though. And you look at the facility, you know, Plainsman Park opened. I thought it was great. It still looks unfinished, though. And if I'm Auburn, I'm thinking, okay, do I want to throw more money behind this when we don't, when the attendance isn't what we want it to be? My question is, why are you not coming to the games? You've had an Omaha team two and three years. Did, did I think Auburn had a chance to win this thing? No. No, I never did. And quite honestly, I thought Auburn would lose to Oregon State when the bracket came out, and that's how I picked it. Uh, early on, I had Auburn in the top eight. You know, State beats these guys two out of three. And that's the thing you start looking at this thing too. You know, uh, people have talked about, you know, how State has done, you know, won some games against the top eight. I mean, I, again, I don't think we're that far off. But you know, I think Auburn is a team that was built to win last year, and they had some injuries, you know, to Fitz and to Owen that uh, limited their pitching prowess, and they paid for it. And then you've got some guys that are maturing a little bit. And Butch is always going to have pitchers. But, uh, you know, when you lose – I don't care how good you are. When you lose your top two pitchers, it's going to be a long season, kind of like we had this year. But they were built to win last year. They worked the portal a little bit, not like some people have suggested. I mean, people see Sonny D and they think, oh, yeah, these guys – you know, a lot of these guys from Auburn are guys that are there, the guys that have just developed and gotten better. But Sonny DeShera comes in and uh, puts together a magical season for Auburn. And then the train ride ends last night, 11-1 to Arkansas. Now, as a Mississippi State guy, I was, I was happy to see Arkansas win over Auburn. I just didn't think Auburn had the juice to beat Ole Miss. I do think Arkansas does. Can they beat them twice, though? That's the question you begin to ask yourself. And I guess right now, if you're a Mississippi State fan, we just talk about doing today's business today. You want Arkansas to win today to, at the very least, force another game tomorrow. And maybe that means that they throw Delusia then and he's not available for the finals. But think about that for a second. Here's what we're talking about. To give Ole Miss a little credit here, our people are like, oh, well, you know, well, they got to, this has got to happen so they don't have this guy available for the series. I mean, you're, you're talking about Ole Miss on the, on the precipice of playing for a national championship. Let that sink in for a second. It's like, oh, yeah, well, this will happen. But they, they won't be able to win a series. Hey, it'd still be number two, right? It's an incredible turn of events. And, again, I've got a lot of respect for that program. I've got a lot of respect for these players. And, again, a lot of them came back. You know, that's the thing I think about, too. You know, LSU a few years ago, they had Jared Poche and Kramer Roberts and all those guys came back, and they still couldn't win it. You know, uh, had a great year but still couldn't win it. And so there are a lot of these guys sometimes that kind of invest themselves in thinking, you know what, pro baseball can wait. I want to win a college World Series. And so we'll see what happens. The thing that I think about is – if you're Ole Miss yesterday, and this is where coaching comes in, you know, you really have to keep your team grounded. Ole Miss woke up yesterday morning 
thinking we're one win away from playing for an AFL championship. One. We just got to win one game. And we got two chances to do it. We, we got to win one, though. And if we can win one, we can rest and get ready to play uh, on Saturday, Sunday, Monday for a chance for an AFL championship, just like our big brothers at Mississippi State did. Arkansas woke up yesterday morning, said, hey, we got to win three in a row. We got to win three in a row. And so, okay, now we've, we've beat Auburn 11 to 1. And to be honest with you, that game is not as close as the score indicated. Arkansas actually had some miscues in that ball game that probably kept this game from really getting out of hand. You can say, Steve, it was 10 runs. I, I, I get it. I just think Arkansas just had more of an edge. And so, Arkansas, I think, has the juice to beat Ole Miss. Can they beat them twice? But Arkansas, again, to kind of get back to that whole mental aspect, they woke up Tuesday morning saying, you know, we got to win three in a row. So they're already thinking and planning for Thursday mentally. There is no chance of them winning their side of the bracket today. They can win a game and force another game. But mentally, they've been geared up to think, hey, we got to go beat three, three quality teams from the SEC three games in a row. So what happens mentally to say Ole Miss if they lose? They hadn't lost in the postseason. I mean, since the SEC tournament, they have swept through the regionals and the super regionals. Now, you can say whatever you want to about their path. They didn't pick the bracket. They just won the games that were in front of them. And, and they beat an Arkansas team the other day, and I didn't think that game was really very competitive. I didn't think Arkansas showed up, and we can talk about Dave Van Horn's pitching decisions, whatever we want to. But the bottom line is Ole Miss went and won the game. Simple as that. They went and won the game. And Ole Miss did a really good job keeping that Arkansas offense at bay. I think Arkansas hit a lot of soft contact, had a lot of routine fly balls to lose you outstanding. But what happens if you wake up tomorrow morning and you're like, oh, we got to play again. That's the real chore. What happens mentally to Oklahoma or Ole Miss, and especially a team like Ole Miss, the last team in, a team that has struggled against Arkansas, and you begin to wonder, okay, if we go into winner-take-all with these guys, what is it going to do for us? So I think the pressure really shifts. And I think, to be honest with you, I think if you're Ole Miss, you got to get this thing done tonight. You got to get this thing done tonight. I don't know that Ole Miss would have the pitching to win another game in this bracket. I think that throwing Gaddis tonight, he's got to go out there and get it done. If not, I think Ole Miss is in trouble tomorrow. And that's what you want to hear. But, you know, Ole Miss is very capable of winning that game tonight. I know Arkansas has some arms available. They have some pitching available. Uh, but I think, I think Ole Miss needs to win this thing today. I think if it goes to – a winner-take-all elimination game, I would have to favor the Razorbacks. Now, on the top end of this bracket, we talk about Oklahoma and A&M. You know, I, I, think, I think Oklahoma is probably okay. I just don't know if A&M has the pitching to come out of the loser's bracket. Really good. Detmer was great yesterday, for sure. And Oklahoma can really swing it. You know, those are things you begin to think about. You know, what do we do now when you've got these uh, – big-time bats facing guys deeper in your rotation. You know, Arkansas basically threw a midweek guy last night. So they're kind of set up well for the next two days. Don't know what happens in the weekend, but they're set up pretty well. You know, like if, if Arkansas wins tonight, do they bring Nolan back on Thursday? It's a good question. You know, he was outstanding uh, Saturday. Do you bring him back on short rest? Because, you know, it's about you win, You do what you have to do to win the game today, right? There's a song out there somewhere that we're affiliated with. It, you know, win the game today. Figure out what you got to do to win the game today. So, uh, again, you know, I'm, I'm pulling against Ole Miss, but, I mean, you, we would be – I mean, here's the thing. It's a rivalry, but at the same time, too, you got to respect what they've done. But one of the things I want to say about this, too, and I've seen this sentiment out here, and I want to go on the record here and kind of offer my feelings – in my opinion, it is my show. Uh, I don't agree with these people that are pulling for Ole Miss. And it, is, it is certainly your, your right and your ability to do that. I know many of you have many Ole Miss friends, and you're like, hey, we had such fun last year winning an AFL championship. I'd love for my friends to be able to share in that this year. I just don't agree with you. I, I don't. And it's nothing against your friends. 
I am a Mississippi State guy first. Simple as that. And so I want what's best for Mississippi State. So Ole Miss winning a baseball NAFL championship a year removed from us winning it is not good for Mississippi State. I don't know that Ole Miss ever winning an NAFL championship will be good for Mississippi State. So if we want to really get some separation between the programs, and there, there has been over the years there has been a tremendous amount of separation. And give Mike Bianco credit. You know, the last handful of years, State has really pulled away in some respects from Ole Miss. Well, this would give them a chance to kind of catch up again, at least not historically, but in, in the modern era, you know, in recent years. And so how is that good for Mississippi State? And so, you know, my attitude about that is this, and, of course, my business is kind of, you know, dependent on Mississippi State doing well. You know, when State's doing well, you guys listen to the show. When State's doing well, you guys subscribe to the website. When State's doing good, you guys buy the books. When State's not doing well, you don't do those things. So maybe my investment in Mississippi State's success is a little different from yours. But I have seen people that have gotten – Mississippi State people that have been really, really upset with other Bulldog fans. Why aren't you pulling for all Miss? Do you hear yourself? Why are we not pulling for all Miss? Are you kidding me? Because we're Mississippi State people. We're Mississippi State fans. No, we're not pulling for them. No, we're not. You're welcome to do it, but don't be upset with the rest of us because we don't share in your line of thinking. Because I want what's best for Mississippi State. You may want what's best for your friends, and that is absolutely your right, but you don't have the right to be critical of other people that don't share in your line of thinking. I want what's best for Mississippi State. Uh, I don't care who it offends. I don't care whose feelings it hurts. I don't care if somebody says, Steve, you're a bad sport. Fine, I'll get a T-shirt printed and wear it everywhere I go. I am a bad sport. I want what's best for Mississippi State. That in no way diminishes the respect that I have for Mike Bianco and his Ole Miss program and, and Tim Elko and these guys are playing a great brand of baseball. Hey, they're, they're fun to watch. I hate it. You know, I, mean, I do because I, I want them to lose. But this is a talented group. Now, we have joked on this show before about Ole Miss not good at sports and historically they really haven't been. They've kind of built themselves up to be. Hey, this is a good team. They were expected to be a good team. They've gotten some guys back that were kind of banged up this year on the pitching side. They kind of retooled their pitching rotation midway through the year. They found some things. And, and Mike Bianco has done a great job. A guy that was under fire, expected to be fired at season's end if they didn't make a tournament. And now here they are just days away from playing for a national championship. How can you not respect it? Even if you don't like it, you can respect it. But I don't want them to win. I don't. I just don't. Again, maybe you feel differently. You're like, oh, well, Steve Jones you know, takes it too far. No, I don't take it too far. I think I take it the appropriate distance. And that is I want Mississippi State to be as good as it can possibly be. And I don't think that we have to kind of forget who we are to get the approval of other people. Well, I, I pulled for you guys. What does that matter? Oh, well, this rebel was pulling for the Bulldogs last year. Well, thank, thanks for your support, but it had nothing to do with the outcome of the game. None. And just like all of you out there that like, hey, well, I'm going to pull for Ole Miss. It doesn't change the game. They're not, they're not going to play any better or worse, no matter your rooting interest. It's not going to happen. And you know, we have this narcissistic belief sometimes that it matters. It doesn't. So, again, not pulling for them. They may win it. They do. And they're capable of winning it. They're good enough to win it. And if they win it, they deserve it. That doesn't mean I have to like it. Now, you may feel differently. Again, it, maybe it runs deeper with me than it does with you. But the reality of it is, is I don't know how Mississippi State benefits in any way from our rival school winning an NFL championship. And as I mentioned yesterday on Facebook to somebody, and it was a very, very, very polite discussion between adults that had varying dis, uh, viewpoints on this issue. And I commend people for not getting personal with that. But I had the discussion, it's like, hey, we're not sister schools. We're rival schools. And I submit that many of the people that feel this way don't know the history and don't know the things that they have done. Do you not remember what those folks put Jackie Sherrill through? Do you not remember that? You don't remember all the memes about Dak Prescott, cheap shots and things like that? You remember that stuff? Because people say, well, Steve, all that stuff you're talking about happened years ago. No, it didn't. It didn't. It's a rivalry. That mean it has to be mean spirited, and I'm sure many of you probably don't see it the same way I do. But I'm I'm a person that's kind of against cultural elitism, you know, and, that, and that's kind of a tenet and a pillar of the Ole Miss experience. You know, we're not snob; we're just better than you. And uh, I don't need their approval. 
again, I respect their baseball team, but I hope they don't win. And I, I didn't – I didn't expect them to get this far, and I commend that team and that staff for the work they've done. And, and again, my angst is not really about these players. I think these – again, it never is about the players because every one of these young men are looking to get an education and to further their careers. They just happen to go to those schools. Now, when, they're, when we're playing, I don't want them to do well, but you don't wish any ill will on these young men because a lot of these guys didn't have a rooting interest in the rivalry until they got here. They're just guys playing a game and getting their education paid for as best they can. And wouldn't make them any different than my own son. You just They had some different opportunities, right? So it's never like that. Now, you know, hey, do I like it when, when uh, Landon Sims you know, strikes out, you know, Peyton Chotney or something? Absolutely, you do. Absolutely, you do. Does that mean Peyton Chotney is not a good player? Absolutely not. The guy can really play. He struggled at times this year. He's been electric in the postseason. So – you can cheer for whoever you want to cheer for. It won't impact the outcome. But I do think there are some people out there, too, that uh, have kind of taken it to the extreme. And I think you got to kind of ask yourself, are you true Maroon or not? I don't know how a true Bulldog could ever just, like, pull for Ole Miss. I, again, I don't need their approval. Maybe you do. All right, time to move on. Let's talk about some Mississippi State baseball stuff. How about that? This final segment of the show brought to you by Portico. If, you don't, if you're unfamiliar with Portico, get familiar today. Get familiar with Portico today. Maybe you've always dreamed of having a place in Starkville. Maybe you've always thought, you know, hey, one day I'm going to retire in Starkville. Maybe now's the time to make that move. Whether it be your primary residence, maybe it's your ballgame weekend retreat, maybe it is a second home for you. Portico has an opportunity to fill those needs for you. My friend, your friend, Mississippi State baseball's friend, Brooks Bryan, Part of a great group of guys and individuals and ladies, a lot of people involved in this process, that are bringing this great residential development to Starkville. Now, phase one's completely sold out. Your new neighbors are already enjoying the high life. Phase two, under construction now, 10 houses being built now, a couple of them already sold. So you've got a chance to buy a house that's in construction now. Or you can say, you know what, Steve, we need a custom build, so we're going to pick out our lot. We're going to have some say in our house plans. You have the freedom to do that. Reach out to Brooks Bryan today, 601-416-8075. Again, that's 601-416-8075. You may be unfamiliar with Brooks. Learn your history. Guy caught a ball, robbed a home run against the University of Washington to send us to Omaha. How about that? This is a guy that's committed to Mississippi State, got committed to this great community, uh, comes from a great family just down the road there in Philadelphia. So, this is uh, not a guy just passing through. So, again, make Portico your next move. Okay, not an awful lot to report on the portal side of things. But, uh, you know, we've had some guys on the high school signing thing that went to the MLB Combine, uh, Dakota, Jordan being one of them, uh, eager to hear what the feedback is there. And, again, I share with you guys this. There was, um, I would say, Maybe two months ago, maybe longer than that, there was this rising school of thought that he was going to sign, that he wanted to sign. And so, hey, that's the expectation he's going to sign. Well, then the, the decision is made, hey, well, listen, we're not going to sign you on the football side because if football signs him and he doesn't come to school, well, you don't get to replace that grant this year. It's, it's spent. That's the way the rules work. You have a hard 25 to work with. Now, those rules may be changing, but you just couldn't afford to take that guy and then him sign. And I think that the chatter about him wanting to sign probably was influential in that decision. It only makes sense, right? Well, then uh, some people close to, to Dakota said, hey, listen, are you ready to pay bills? Are you ready to do all the, you know, the things that adults do? And so that kind of put some thought in his head, too. And he's like, you know, I think I'm going to go to school, maybe grow up a little bit, kind of learn to live on my own some. And then he gets invited to the MLB Combine. And at that point, you know, he had not really set up a lot of pre-draft workouts. And so there has been some ebb and flow with him. Now, do we expect him to come in here and start as a freshman? I would say probably not. But I think he's certainly capable of getting playing time as a freshman. I think he's also a guy, too, that some school, that some schools, that some teams will target because they believe that he wants to sign. This is one that won't be settled, I don't think, until, uh, you know, maybe August. I mean, you know, the, of course, the draft didn't take place until July 19th. But uh, the reality of it is, is, you know, they have some time to kind of figure this thing out before they enroll in school. And so, um, eager to see what happens with him. Uh, that, 
I think it's one of those situations, too, where him is – you know, Dakota's one of these guys that has the, a lot of natural ability. I think his best baseball is to come, which is one of the reasons that there he is getting some Major League Baseball attention. But he is a guy that probably benefits, uh, you know, from coming to to school. And only he can decide that for himself. You know, that's not, not a situation that we can all look at and say, hey, this is for the best. Now, Bradley Lofton. Left-handed pitcher, and I have had one Major League Baseball scout tell me that he is the key to Mississippi State signing class, that he is a guy that will be a dude. He is a guy that has the potential to be a first-rounder in a couple of years of college. And then we'll see. And there are a lot of people out there that say, hey, well, let's go get him and get him in the minors, and then we can get him to the big sooner rather than later. Now, I, listen, I get it. We touched on the show. He didn't have a great outing against Northwest Rankin. That's baseball. But when you look at his – career record, you look at his senior season in its entirety, you can see why people really like him. Guys from the left-hand side don't normally throw that hard and have the, the break that he does on that breaking ball. This is a big league guy. A lot of people close to them tell me it's going to be very difficult for him to pass on an opportunity to play at Mississippi State. It's going to take life-changing type money. Now, that's the rub now is how close is he to getting that? And what do we consider life-changing money? Is it $2 million? Is it a $1 million? You know, I don't know. I don't know what everybody's price tag is. And that's the thing you begin to think about, too, is like, okay, if I can sign now you know, for $500,000, what if I get the benefit of going to Mississippi State for two to three years and then I can sign for millions later? So that's the risk a lot of these guys run. And like you mentioned, you know, Dakota Jordan, uh, you know, that, that's a guy. Is he, gonna, is he willing to sign for $150,000? Because a lot of young people, this is why they need agents and advisors and things of that nature, a lot of people see those big numbers and they think, man, $150,000 is a lot of money. Well, over the totality of your life and the fact that you're giving up your college eligibility, maybe it's not. Maybe that's not a lot of money. When you don't have any money, it seems like a fortune. But when you begin to think about, okay, do I, am I a sucker for the quick reward here? Am I going to take $150,000 now? And then, you know, sign basically an entry-level contract and then never really make that money up? Or do I go invest two to three years on the college level at a place like Mississippi State and then sign for millions later? And also kind of change the, uh, you know, my trajectory as a professional baseball player where a program is more invested in me financially. And so you, you think about that with Bradley, too. At any time that you've got guys on the left-hand side that can throw it below and have a three-pitch mix, uh, they're going to be – draft candidates there's no question about it but of course uh you know Bradley's a guy we're just kind of waiting to see what's going to happen with him hopefully to get some information from him uh you know sooner rather than later but um you know again the only guy for sure that we feel like is going to go is Jet Williams now, outside of that I think we're in pretty good shape um Austin Tomasini from Madison Central there's a lot of people that really like him a lot of people that really like him and think you know that he's a guy that will develop into you know a Pretty significant pro prospect after his college career is done. And, of course, uh, Ross Highfield. I'm a huge Ross Highfield fan. I'm a fan of the athletic catcher. Not not necessarily the Yogi Berra catcher, You're right? I, mean, I don't mean that in a disrespectful way. The game has changed a lot. You know, but I came up in the era, you know, and there's Johnny Bench and there's people like that and Gary Carter, guys that were um, – Great catchers, but not always great athletes. And all of a sudden, a guy named Benito Santiago and Tony Pena come along, and all of a sudden you begin to realize that the position was changing. Javi Lopez, you know, those guys the guys come along, and all of a sudden they're, they're more athletic as catchers. They're not just big guys up there that can block up the baseball. They're guys that can make plays for it. I, I see Ross in that same vein. I see Ross is a guy that is an athlete playing catcher. I'm not going to sit here and make these, you know, broad comparisons between him and big league players, but I think Ross Highfield is one of those guys that can be a star at Mississippi State, provided that he stays healthy and provided he continues to work hard. I think Ross Highfield is one of those guys that will be an absolute dude for Mississippi State. And you need guys like him. We talk about, you know, signing guys from the high school ranks. You know, you want to sign those guys that uh, are getting Major League Baseball attention but maybe value the college experience – a little bit more now. You know, the pros will be there. You know, we've had some guys in the past who say, you know what, hey, the, N the MLB will always be there. I don't have a chance to play college baseball really one time in life. And once you make that decision, you can't go back. 
And so I think it's important to kind of understand that you're getting guys like Ross Highfield, that's the difference between going to Omaha and not. You know, he's not the only one. My trying to sit here and you know, put a lot of weight on his shoulders and say this is a kid that's got to carry us. But in order for us – to be back where we want to be in contention for Omaha every year, these are the kind of guys you got to get. You got to get these guys signed and get them to come to school. You know, Ross is a guy too. Go go watch his highlight video. This is a guy that gets triples on a regular basis. You know, how, how many how many catchers have we had? You know, over the years that uh, had that type of athleticism, not a whole lot. I mean, I think the guy's going to be a special player for us, and he's not the only one. You know, we're going to have – this is a really, really good class. It's not rated in the top ten for nothing. Yeah, Colby Holcomb is a guy, too, at Northeast Community College. A lot of people thought he was going to go pro. A lot of discussion now that he's going to be here. And so, you know, that's what people wonder about. Man, Steve, we got to get some arms. And we'll get some arms out of the portal, but you're kind of looking at this 2022 class. Logan Forsythe, right-handed pitcher. Um McLean Ray, a Tupelo, right-handed pitcher. And, the, and listen, Tupelo has turned down some good ones over the years, right? Have they not? Uh, Jackson Parker out of Stringer High School, first base, left-handed pitcher. I think he sticks at first base. Evan Sierra, Starwell Academy, right-handed pitcher. Of course, Bradley Lofton's a lefty. Will Gibbs from Preps, a right-hander. Uh, Brock Tapper, a left-hander from DeSoto Central. Uh, we mentioned Tomasini, a right-hander. Um, you know, Jarell... Gerangelo Sagente, haven't been able to get a hold of him. He's the, he's the ambidextrous pitcher. Had a really good combine. It'll be interesting to see what happens there. Uh, Nathan Williams, right-handed pitcher out of South Carolina. We mentioned Colby Holcomb as a right-hander. Then there's Max Miller, a left-hander from Van Cleve. Uh, Graham Yanetma from uh, junior college, a lefty there. So I think when you start looking through this, you know, there are a lot of arms on the way. And that's the thing, too. I think it's important to understand – you know, we've got them coming from two different directions, and we've got them coming from the signing class. We've got them coming from the portal. Your staff has kind of addressed some of these needs. We have thrown some scholarship allocation and allotted some spots on the roster for these guys. So it's going to be a very competitive and busy fall, but there is some some reinforcements on the way. It's not a situation where everybody's just kind of sitting around hoping the guys that are returning are the only guys that can contribute. There will be a ton of arms available for Mississippi State this fall. It's going to be about finding the guys that can throw strikes and to help make us a more competitive baseball team to get us back to Omaha. If you hadn't done so, go to dogpiledthebook.com. That's D-A-W-G-P-I-L-E, thebook.com, and get signed copies of uh, Dogpile. And while you're there, you can get copies of all my sports books. It's Flim Flam, Alpha Dogs, Stark Villains. And as I mentioned before, copies of Villains and Alpha Dogs are dwindling daily. So if you're thinking about, well, I'll just wait for that. No, you're not going to be able to wait because I'm telling you, we're going to exhaust all the inventory. Matter of fact, we recently had the bookstore in Mississippi run out of Stark Villains, got another case, and we told them it's probably the last case for a while. So if you need to fill out your collection, and I suggest you do, go to dogpilethebook.com and get that taken care of today. Stark Villains and Alpha Dogs, again, again, very, 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 very limited quantities available. All right? If you're looking for Blooms of Oleander, and many of you are, I get about a message a week about that. Very simple. You can find it, just Google Blooms of Oleander, but you can find it at Amazon, booksandmegan.com, barnesandnoble.com, or if you want to buy it through your local bookstore and throw them some business, you absolutely can. They can order it through Ingram. Uh, they're happy to do so. And if you're looking for Stark Villains gear, yeah, we should get excited about Really excited about Stark Villains gear. Go to starkvillains.com. Again, I got people out here doing work, and so sometimes we get excited. You go to StarVillains.com and uh, get yourself outfitted with some Stark Villains gear. That's it for today, man. Until next time, let's all live our lives in a way we make more friends than enemies and people can see a difference in the way we live. You made it. Checked out of office to check into the sweet views of this place where the kids aren't asking for the Wi-Fi. Mom, can we go to the pool? And when you're with Amex, it's not if it's going to happen, but when. American Express. Don't live life without it. Target has laundry day covered because they offer a great selection of concentrated Tide Pods to help with all your laundry needs. Tide Pods clean, freshen, and help rejuvenate your clothes with odor fighters and stain removers. Did you know Tide Pods clean better than the leading liquid bargain detergent? Tide Pods are powerful enough to make your whites white and your brights bright, even in cold water. Just toss in one Tide Pod for small loads, two for medium, three for large. It's that easy. For great value and convenient pickup options, get Tide Pods today at Target.